I mean, there's so many people with side hustles and a lot of those side hustles are in many cases generating more income or the same amount of income as their primary source of income. So I think there are more financial institutions that have adapted, recognizing that that's becoming a norm and it is a viable source of income. I hope the big banks and when I talk big banks, you know, you know who I'm talking about. I hope they start recognizing that there is an evolution of how people are making money these days. And you mentioned side hustles, like how many people are baking cupcakes out of their house and making a couple thousand bucks extra a month. That's a yeah. lot of, it's a lot of bread, a lot of, a lot of cake. It's a lot. <laughs> All right. Hello. Welcome to episode 158 of KT Confidential, the real estate podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Ariel. He's Adrian. Today. Hello. 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 First time home buyers. Yeah. Perfect timing. Good, good idea for the topic. Coincides nicely with the recent article we wrote and the first time home buyer guide we've published. Which yeah, we I really like that first time home buyer guide. You know, I like the fact that it's free. You don't have to sign up to any, you know. Well, yeah. One thing I hate is when you get all these companies that ask you to drop in your email address and name in order to download a guide, which, and and then you get the guide and it's just provides zero value. Well, the problem Um, with most of these guides, and I think it's pretty notorious in the real estate industry that there are, there's one production, there's a company that produces a guide and then takes that and sells it to realtors. They go to realtors and they say, hey, you need a first time home buyer guide. Why don't you buy mine and I'll brand it as yours and you can use it. Yeah. So they pay the $495 and these guys grant them the access to this guide and the same product getting pushed out by everybody. Ours, which in itself is is not adapted from scratch. Right. Real world experiences, expertise, and um, some great design work in that. I'll give credit to you and Stacy for that. You guys did a great job putting that together. And I highly recommend. Pardon me? I take no credit for the design. I just gave the content and Stacy worked her magic. Yep. It looks good. An easy read. Lots of great tips. We're going to elaborate a little bit about that in the podcast today. Sounds good. I'm just going to actually pull it up. I haven't even opened it up. On my There's computer a lot of first time I mean, I wrote it so I know what's in right it. now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's easy to talk about a lot of first time home buyers in the market right now and uh, a lot of um, immigrants buying, looking to purchase their first home, especially with mortgage rates being low and um, a lot of new immigration going to be happening um, right across the country over the next 12 and 24 months. So I think it's uh, very timely. Well, I think now it is one of the big things I got to say. All of these guides, they talk about what you need to do. But one thing that I really wanted to, I tried to put an emphasis on is also the emotional side of things. Like with social media, there's a lot of uh, talk about the market and how it's unaffordable. It's very discouraging uh, content out there. And I think what's important is just to have a roundtable conversation type of thing around the concept of, Uh, the mindset of buying your first home and the fact that it doesn't need to be your first home per se, as much as it does, it is just a house that you purchase. And whether that's where you live as your primary residence or where you, uh, your first exploration of being a landlord. I think, you know, a lot of people need to start looking at real estate more as a new, just an avenue of investment just as the stock market is, just as cryptocurrency is, just as all these things are. And getting your foot in the door today will set you up for success a decade from now. Yeah, 100%. I think, you know, what I want to talk a little bit about is the actual owner living in the property. So this is their actual home, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, by the way, 
So this is episode 158. Again, um, KT Confidential, the real estate podcast. We're talking about first-time home buyers and some first-time home buyer tips. If you like and subscribe to wherever you're watching or listening, you'll get notifications of the next episodes. Episode 159 next week is a great, this is a great segue into that because we're going to be talking about first-time home owner tips. So what happens after you buy? You move in or even pre-moving in a little bit. Um, Some great discussion and great tips on how to be a first-time homeowner. A lot of people don't know that either. So I know like... You know, I was a first time home buyer, uh, 16, 17 years ago now. And, um, I didn't know anything. Well, and that one can be segmented into homeowners, uh, from the perspective of that that person walking across the screen, like a chicken that's Jen. Yeah. I saw Jen and Millie walking around there. Yeah. I asked Uh, Millie to grab me a glass of water because I realized I didn't set myself up. So she was kind enough to do that. I'd have to yell up the stairs and ask Alicia. Fortunately, I've got a little bit left in here. Um, yeah, so for first-time homeowners, you've got two segments. One is if they're buying it as an investment. So there will be tips in there about how to uh, be successful from that perspective. And then also if you're using it as a primary residence, a lot of things that people don't take into consideration. Well, maybe we should break that down and even do a, a third episode. This can be like a, um, a trilogy podcast and the third one talking about first time investor tips. There you go. That there you go. We made that decision right here live. <laughs> Episode 160 uh will be first time investor tips. And for those so, of you who are uh, listening cuz we get I've had a lot of people lately say that they they watch the podcast but they don't subscribe necessarily. So for those of you who may be regular listeners, thank you. And we do really appreciate if you take the 20 seconds it takes to uh, comment on the podcast and hit the subscribe button so you won't miss out on the upcoming episodes also. Thank you for the support. Well, and I think we're going to have some plans to do some some giveaways, some shout outs and things like that um, as we start planning for 2022. And um, yeah, we put a lot of time, love, effort and money uh, into producing this show every week. So uh, would be nice to to get those numbers up. All right, let's get going. We're going to get into it. Let's get into it. Let's do it. What's the first thing you've got on your head or on your pad of paper? My pad of paper. First thing, mortgage. Of course, always the first thing. Um, Sounds so simple, but sitting down or having a call virtually, in person, whatever you want to do. A mortgage broker will sit down and analyze your income, your expenses, your credit. They'll look at it all. Uh, Your money available. That's important for a total down payment. Where's that Mm -hmm. money coming from? They'll dig in a little bit and talk about, um, you know, how you're paid. So are you paid bonuses? Are you paid commission? Are you self-employed? Are you know? Are you on a salary? How long have you been employed? They need to know the story. The on that note, I think story. that's a, that's probably a big one because a lot of people think, oh, I made you know one hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars last year, but you may not realize how the bank interprets your income, and if twenty or fifty thousand of that, whatever, was uh, due to bonuses and or uh, commissions or whatever, uh, that isn't just taken as straight income. Um, so we get a lot of people who will say, oh yeah, I'm not worried about that. Finances aren't an issue, but it's still a good idea to take that initial step to go speak with a mortgage well, broker. And and some people don't recognize. So as an example, I had a client that was a uh, waitress at a high-end restaurant and she made about a hundred grand a year as a waitress at this restaurant and she worked, you know, 60 to 70 hours a week. So she worked a lot. Um, but about 60% of her income was tips, right? Was cash. 
So she had the money and saved money because she'd been working at that job for several years. Uh, but her tax returns didn't necessarily correlate with the amount of money she was actually making. Shame on her uh, or not, but it happens. Uh, cash tips, you know, uh, go into your pocket sometimes. So, um, and it's, it's variable income. It is not predictable. It is not consistent. That's right. right. That's why people that are self-employed or paid on commission, like realtors have a really tough time sometimes getting a mortgage because of that. Yeah, um, anyone because, self-employed. Yeah. Although in um, recent years, there's been a lot of changes and I think there's uh, more flexibility with some lenders because of, I mean, there's so many people with side hustles and a lot of those side hustles um, are in many cases generating more income or the same amount of income as their primary source of income. So I think there are more financial institutions that um, have adapted, recognizing sure. that that's becoming a norm and it is a viable source of income. I hope the big banks, and when I talk big banks, you know, you know who I'm talking about. Um, I hope they start recognizing that there is an evolution of how people are making money these days. And um, you mentioned side hustles, like how many people are baking cupcakes out of their house and making, you know, a couple thousand bucks extra a month. That's a yeah. lot of, it's a lot of bread, a lot of, a lot of cake. It's a lot. <laughs> I was hoping you would have gone with a lot of cake or something. It would have been very appropriate. Yeah, um, absolutely. So sit, sitting down with a, or or having that chat, having that chat. Um, don't don't simply go on to a mortgage calculator, plug in. Oh, I make seventy grand. My spouse makes seventy grand. We pay X amount for our vehicles and expenses, whatever. And oh yeah, affordability one point one million. And, uh, and then you, even worse, you start looking at homes that are priced at 1.1, which end up selling for 1.3. You're tro totally screwing yourself out of the gate. So yes, um, having a pre-approval or a pre-qualification can also be two different things. And those terminologies mean different things to different lenders. Uh, what you want to make sure is that it's just not a you know, one of those 30 second approvals where you're plugging in the numbers, they do a quick credit search and say, yep, you're, you could be pre-approved for up to this amount. Yeah. Um, you want you them want reviewing your, your proof of income, all those documents. If they haven't done that, then uh, you need to insist on it. And you may also perhaps question and I, and, if that's the right person to be handling your mortgage. Well, and not just reviewing them themselves, it's actually submitting it to the underwriter, right? To the, yeah. the actual lender and saying, hey, Mr. Lender, can you review this? Now, the difficulty becomes right now throughout COVID, um, you know, I mean, we're nearing the end of 2021. Uh, so for the last two years, a lot of these financial institutions are running on a more kind of like a skeleton staff for them, right? Like if they had six people in one department before, they might be down to three or four now. Yeah. Um, and of those three or four, they might all be working from home. So it's not as simple as turning around and saying, hey, Joe, can you look at file 117, right? Um, don't ask me why I picked the name Joe or the number 117. I often but resort to using Joe. Yeah. That's that's reality, right? I mean, um, so the problem becomes, um, is somebody actually going to review the file in detail? And how long is that going to take? Right? right. So so if you're out shopping for homes and you're you're out there preemptively. Good segue maybe into talking about preemptive offers at some point. Um, but if you're out there preemptively, like pre-qualified letter in hand, and you're looking at homes and you want to put an offer on something, if you haven't gone to that in, through that process, um, 
you know. Yeah. Good luck. Well, Good and luck having that, that approval quickly, and having, having that, that gives letter. you the peace of mind, allows you to. Well, it gives you condition. the peace of mind, but it also gives you a tool for the offer, right? Like if you are competing against other offers and you're able to provide stuff like that, you never know what little piece of information may be the deciding factor in someone accepting an offer. Well, the homes right now that everybody wants to buy and they're short supply, right? Like everything is on short supply. So everything is like any type of home, whether you're talking three-story town, two-story town, condo, fully detached, semi-detached, whatever, no supply in homes right across the GTA, right across Canada for the most part. So, you know, if you want to put an offer in and there's like, there's a home that I was interested in, in looking at, um, you know, kind of at the top of our budget, but we have a bit of room to stretch. And I looked at it, looked at the variables, looked, did a quick CMA, comparative market analysis um, and realized, Ooh, this is, this is probably going to sell for about 10% more than it's actually listed at. Right. And sure enough, they had, they had nine offers on it. Right. So, and it's not a, not a home that would appeal to the masses. So um, even the less desirable homes are, are getting lots of attention. So you need to be armed with the ability to know I can put an offer in on this place and I am approved for the mortgage. Not well, and you bring up a good point about the the list price not necessarily being a good indication of selling price. And it can go either direction. There are, you know, there ten percent is a big swing. And you know, for many people, that would make it no longer feasible to purchase. So um I would also say as a, a good a guide for first time buyers is stop looking online really just get to the next step of speaking with a uh, a real estate agent um which we can get into that stuff as well but rely on them for a bit more guidance on what you should be looking at well and then picking the right person to trust them that they know what the hell they're talking about that's a whole other discussion yeah. anyways i mean in terms of mortgage right now being a first time home buyer is exciting because the mortgage rates are super super low we know they're going up um it's going to take a long time like i was looking i just did a whole bunch of purging in my house and i'm decluttering quote unquote to prepare in the event that we we do make a move and um so I was getting rid of all kinds of old, old documents, right? Documents have a way of sticking around forever, like old tax papers and whatever. Yeah. And I went through and found a box that was full of all of my home purchase agreements, old floor plans, old building plans and upgrade lists and all that. And I found my original mortgage contract for my first house. Yeah. What was your rate? I don't even remember what mine was. I think it was 3.7. 5.89. I think mine was 3.7, something like that. 5.89. I mean, I think my lowest mortgage right now is probably with you on our property on Broussard. Yeah. And I believe it's at 1.45. I'm not mistaken. Something around, uh, around there. Higher. No, it's 1.65. <laughs> Bank breaker. It's much higher. Much higher. Yeah. Well, as a percentage, that is quite um, a bit. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, sorry, my internet connection's a little unstable. Uh, I think because these two ladies are are working from here today and our you internet at the studio end. sucks. Yeah, you seem fine on my um, end, so you're good. The um, one thing just with mortgage broker too, the, one of the reasons that's good to go do that immediately is because you can lock in a rate and it seems inevitable that next year we will see uh, increases in mortgage oh, rates. We it's, already it's are. inevitable. Yeah, it's inevitable. And, you know, if we, wa if we want to talk about the specifics of mortgages, um, I'm a big fan of variable rates. I get that question a lot. Ariel, should I go variable or fixed? Um, even with the rates going up, 
variable mortgages give you a little bit more flexibility in the event that you want to break that mortgage, right? So on a uh, variable mortgage, typically, uh, if you need to break it for whatever reason, you want to refinance the house, you want to pull out equity, you want to buy something else, you want to make a move, um, three months interest and a admin fee of some sort is the typical cost to break it. Which yeah, f- which makes sense, but also keeping in mind with fixed rates, if you're just move, you can still move. You typically port your mortgage and you don't incur those expenses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with now, rates now going it up, fixed, it might right. Yeah, it might be worth it to lock it in. If you're a first time home buyer, actually, and I did that at my 5.89, I wish I didn't because a couple of years later the rates went down. But when we're talking about 2% or 2.5%, yeah, uh, which is where more or less most of the five year fixed terms are right now, if if you're a first time buyer and you know that, you know, you're going to be there for three, four, five years, it could be worth a, worth a look. However, I, I, you know, to that point, I want to add rate is not everything. A lot of people shop for the best rate, but you want to fully understand the fine print. So what is exactly the cost of breaking this mortgage in the middle of the mortgage, right? Let's say, let's say you just got engaged and you're looking forward to building a family, getting married, whatever. And you say, well, the first step is let's move out of mom and dad's house and buy a house together. Well, two years go by, you hate each other, you want to kill each other and you want to, you know, one wants to move to Vancouver. So the pessimistic. Other one. I thought you were going to say, oh, now you get pregnant and have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm looking at in the event you want to break that mortgage. Oh, for whatever yeah, reason. Let's tell everybody plan for plan for it just in case. <laughs> oh, well, maybe funny. maybe you want to quit your job. Yeah, I had I had a client like this. Him and his fiance they bought a house together. She got pregnant. He's like, I don't, I don't, I hate my job. Not making enough money. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to do it all on my own now. But needed needed some equity, needed some capital to get that business started. The only way mm-hmm. to do that was to refinance the house and, and pull out equity of the house. And it made more sense to, to break the mortgage. Um, anyways, there's all kinds of scenarios that, well, okay, if you want to, if you want to be the optimistic, uh, you can... You want to be the optimist, is that right? Uh, if you want to be optimistic yes. about about it, and let's say in your scenario, oh yeah, lovey dovey, you get pregnant, and oh, but we only bought a one bedroom condo. Now we want to search for a three bedroom townhouse, whatever, right? It's situational. Life changes all the time, um, so you need to have that flexibility. So know what it is to break that mortgage. And also know what your prepayment options are. So, you know, um, you well, prepayment and missed payments. Like, there's a lot of different skip, products out there. Skip a payment. Yeah, I did that a couple of times during COVID. RBC allows you to skip a payment. We didn't have income for several months, so skip a payment or very little income. Skip a payment. Why not? You, if you need the money. So you need to have uh, a full understanding of what the options are. How do I pay? Do I, can I access all of the information online? Um, you know, all of those things. Because a lot of lenders are different. Yeah. And oftentimes the very best rate would also be the very worst terms and conditions. Yeah. Well, and then sometimes they have little gimmicks like incentives of cashback or whatever. So you're just good to know what all mm. of the, all of the very, very, very careful. If you're taking are. any additional incentives, be very, very careful. If you're taking any additional incentives, it's just like when you're buying a, a vehicle. Uh, we talked about this before. 
you buy a vehicle and they offer you 0% financing. I like so nowadays, though, how they have to break that down. They have to disclose that in the auto industry now. Yes. Uh, in mortgages, I don't know if it's a legal requirement. Most of them do, but it's in very fine print that nobody do ever they? brings okay. up. Okay. So to explain that um, uh, to people, basically what that is, is if there's a cashback incentive, usually that cashback incentive is in lieu of another option. So as an example, if you were to buy a car at 0% and take advantage of the finance option, you may be foregoing the cash incentive of a $5,000 cashback. So what they do is they then break right. down and say, okay, well, you're, you're giving up $5,000 for the zero percent, which means in essence, you're paying five thousand dollars for the financing option, which works out to be an interest rate of two point seven five percent. In in the nineties and and two uh, thousands, two thousand and five, that was big in the auto industry. A lot of people mm. got hoodwinked over that. Let me tell you, yeah. like you was it? I think a, it was while we were in the industry that that came into play, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you have a twenty thousand dollar car with zero percent financing. Oh yeah, sounds great. But here comes uh, little old Betty with a bag full of cash that wants to buy the car. She can buy it for fifteen grand. So your cost of borrowing is that five thousand bucks. Right. But if Betty had the twenty thousand dollars, would she have been better to put it into an investment for five years? <laughs> that depends on more, the math, I suppose. Depends depends what kind of investment it is. If you look at the difference with real estate prices over that five years, maybe buying a little one bedroom condo would have been very beneficial. Yes. Um, so enough on mortgage, go and talk to a mortgage broker. Um you know, it doesn't hurt to ask for references, who they deal with in terms of lenders. Uh, if you are made it up with a, or you have hooked up with a realtor already, they may have uh, somebody in their database. Oftentimes realtors have brokers that they use uh, as a referral. Uh, any realtor that is getting a quote unquote bonus pay or kickback or whatever you want to call it from a mortgage broker. It must be disclosed to you. It um, actually doesn't because in the agreement of purchase and sale, it says there's a clause that they're signing to say that. Oh, you're, you are right. So it is technically disclosed, but rarely probably read. Yeah, you are right. Specifically, it actually talks about mortgage. Um, yeah, it should be disclosed. And I always actually tell because in I don't know, I can't think off the top of my well, head that there's any trades I refer to that get, give me any sort of reimbursement for the referrals. I simply do it because I I like to well, be it's that kind of become a team clients. policy, right? Yeah, Mike, it's strictly a referral to take care of our database of our clients. So, yeah. All right. Moving on to deposit. Getting an income call from Chicago. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's a um, call that uh, you can miss. Deposit. The So just to just, just decipher between deposit and down payment, <laughs> deposit is needed up front. Down payment is needed later. So deposit is the money you're putting as a, uh, uh, as consideration to make your offer legally binding, um, could be anywhere from a dollar to a hundred thousand dollars or more, depending on what you're buying and depending on where you're buying. Um, as an example, in Peel, Halton, Toronto, you know, a lot of listing agents will try to push for five percent uh, of the selling price. That's common, um, but you know, it's often very negotiable. Um, I'd say. I don't know how often, maybe half the time we could probably get away with less. Um, but then in areas like Hamilton, which I see changing, uh, $5,000 was very common regardless of the purchase price. It depends where you are in the province or in the country, uh, yeah. depending on where you're listening to, because 
if you buy something in North Bay, and that might be changing now too, but you go to Sault Ste. Marie, and you got 2500 bucks in your pocket, you can probably put a, down, a, a deposit on a house. If you got 2500 bucks and you're in Mississauga, yeah, if you got 2500 bucks in your pocket and you try to buy something in Mississauga, you can't even rent uh, a house. <laughs> you, you that's right. You don't even have enough for first and last month rent. So, it depends where you are in the GTA and it's starting to broaden as you said Hamilton needs to be 5 grand, 10 grand. Um now we're seeing that change. Uh, same thing out in, you know, Grimsby, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, all those areas um, used to be common, you know, us selling in those areas when we had a listing out in Woodstock, Kitchener, Cambridge, whatever, and we're asking for 5%, the realtors that only oh, service they that area. Stink. Oh, they're like, ah, you're I'm not you. in the city anymore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, five grand that. here is common. <laughs> yeah. Um, a deposit can be whatever the seller accepts. So it could be a dollar or it could be, you know, 99% of the selling price. It, it's yeah. Um, There's so, so many variables. I mean, like if we're representing the sellers, we're pushing for bigger deposits. If we're representing the buyers, you know, trying to find a happy medium. The, or the more deposit you have, the more, um, you know, more stability there is in your offer. Yeah, uh, the more competing. confidence the seller has in your offer, you know, if you're sell, if you know, if you go to buy a million dollar home, and you're coming to the table with ten grand, you're gonna get laughed at, right? Yeah. But all of a sudden, if you have a hundred grand, and you say, "Well, here's a hundred grand in consideration for accepting my offer," you know, now you're serious. You're a serious buyer if you if you throw in a hundred grand down, um, you know, fifty grand, yeah, that's reasonable. 20 grand? Uh, Depends on the scenario. Pushing it, pushing if, you're, if you're buying in that 800 to a million range and you've got 20K and you're not competing against other offers, you can sometimes build a compelling story saying, yeah, they've got more money, yeah. but it's tied up in GICs if, until next month. If, right? If there are no other offers. But that's yes. when you can also construct an offer. And this, you know, we wanted to talk about timing and having the deposit readily available. You can construct a clause in one of the schedules that says, all right, we're going to give you twenty thousand um, dollars upon acceptance, so do within twenty four hours, uh, and then we're going to give you another twenty grand in seventy five days, and another twenty grand in one hundred eighty. You can construct that uh, a little right. bit different. Very much like very much like new construction does. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Uh, the key is you got your mortgage pre-qualified you know what you can afford now um roughly you know that you're gonna need right, right about 20 uh five uh, percent 25 five uh percent of the purchase price make that money available to be withdrawn in a certified or bank draft um within that 24 hours yes. right you got to know Okay, I've got that 50k now available that I can go to the bank at any time, get a bank draft, and away we go. If it's tied up, or if you do online banking like Tangerine, good luck getting a uh, a bank draft or a certified check or whatever they do within 24 hours. If you have GICs where they're tied up, RRSPs where you're trying to pull out and take advantage of the first time home buyer uh, RRSP plan. Um, TFSAs, whatever, it's going to take a little bit of time. So, well, let's also clarify sure the that it doesn't in your matter account. where the money comes from for the deposit per se. It could be a family member providing it in the interim. So, if you've got mom or dad, and mom and mom or dad might front the twenty k or thirty k to help you get the deal, and then you're reimbursing them in a few days. The only factor then is your real estate agent will need um, identification from the third party who's providing the deposit. That's all. And your mortgage broker might need to know that too, depending if on... If it's part of the mortgage, yes. Yeah, if it's money that's... If you're not reimbursing your family member, then... Yeah, yeah it could be a gift. Sure. If it's a gift, it's okay. That's why I said might. Yeah. 
Uh, last thing I want to talk about is one topic which you mention frequently, especially when talking to first-time buyers. It's not your forever home. You want to elaborate on that? Well, I think that's even evolved into it may be your never home. <laughs> like, um, I think there's, especially with, I mean, it's old news now, but just how popular home, you know, HGTV, that whole network has become and everything home related. It's, you know, that the industry drives our economy uh, to a very high degree. And there's so much stuff out there with social media, people get so obsessed with wanting the perfect home and wanting beautiful finishes and all this stuff. And I can say consistently that the people that are, that can see beyond that and they don't think of it that way, they always do better. They're always in a better position. So yeah, it's not likely your forever home. Um, especially as a first time home buyer, if you're in your twenties or thirties, you know, life changes quickly and you may, move out of the area, you may uh, have a family, you may, who knows. Um, so don't get too caught up on it. Just find a place that is um, suitable, that serves a purpose, get your feet, your feet in the door, your foot in the door. And then most people have feet, two of them. It's hard to put two feet in a door. It's kind of like you lunge forward and put one foot in the door. And that's the whole point is you just you, you jump in with both in feet. Come on that's a different analogy. Okay. Work with me here. Um, well, here's yeah. a, here's a good reason to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, Adrian and I purchased a townhome, two story townhome just over two years ago. August and our 19, right? Something like yeah, that. September of September. August or September. We bought in August, close August. September. Yeah. I think so. So two years ago, um, we purchased this two-story townhome in our neighborhood and our now second tenant will be vacating. So we had two pretty good tenants, one in there for a year and this one for 14 months. Um, and we've decided to sell it and we're going to vlog some of it and let you guys see the transformation. This house, when we bought it, and it still is a little bit ugly, right? It's got carpet throughout. The color yeah. scheme is yeah. is not nice. No, nope. um, it's what most of our first time home buyers would walk into and kind of give uh, us a little I bit need of a, hardwood floors. <laughs> yeah, or well, we're not even putting hardwood in it, so that's a that's a whole other discussion. No, I know, but like I a lot of people, have, that's on their list, right? I have to have hardwood carpet. floors. I cannot carpet. have carpet, yeah. or I can't yeah. have siding. I need brick. Come on, people, right? Um, it's it's easy to do some of those cosmetic things. Um, yeah. or you don't even need than, to. Let's say you don't even do anything. Let's talk about that. You move in and you walk on carpet for two years. How much has yeah. the house gone up in value, Ariel, if we do nothing to it? Yeah, I mean, listen, certain things like hardwood floors, if you spend the money to install it, you're probably getting at least 100% return on that investment in this market. I hate carpet, especially regular, quote unquote, broad loom. I don't know, you know, that's a real estate term that's yeah, been around. Yeah, I don't around know. I mean, I know decades. what Berber is. I don't know what non Berber is, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's broad loom. Like, yeah, okay, I guess called. so. Um, I can't stand it. Like I, you know, I have dust allergies, so that's that's a problem. Um, I don't think it looks good. I have Berber and a few of our bedrooms at home now, and that's not bad, but it, you know, doesn't doesn't do anything for me. So me personally, I also hate carpet. Um, much rather have. Why'd you lay carpet in your basement then? All right. Well, first of all, it's not throughout the basement. 
I put it in the, we'll call it the living room or a theater room or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Because we have a big, I don't know how big that TV is, but it's really big and built in speakers. And we set that up as kind of the movie room. So number one, carpet dampens the sound. So you don't have that tinny echoey uh, feeling. Number two, I spent a shit ton of money on that carpet. And when you step on that carpet, you ever gone into a hotel room, like a, a higher end hotel room after a long day of travel and you just hop on the bed and want to relax and you're like, oh my God, this is so comfortable. This is the best bed ever. You ever been to a hotel like that? I can't say I have. Well, maybe you should treat yourself. I <laughs> have and it feels great. That's how my feet feel when I walk on that carpet. So, yeah. and it's, and it's in a, I don't know how big that room is, maybe 13 by 12. So like 150 square feet or so. Um, and that's the only area that it's in. Right. So if it's, you know, with, within reason. Um, but yeah, even that, pain in the ass to upkeep versus a laminate or a vinyl vinyl is very popular right now that's what we're considering for uh for our Isn't townhouse that hard, i mean laminate hardwood you're gonna well, sweep and you then spill, you're gonna mop if, it if every you have now kids and then. yes if, you, if kids, you make a mess you have pets. well we're talking first-time home buyers so not as high a probability why first-time home buyers can't have kids how oh, i just said not as not as high a probability of having kids i don't agree i think a lot of first-time home buyers have kids uh, sure, but I'm saying if you look at all the home, first-time home buyers, what about pets? I, what about I, what about okay, pets? That's a different argument. Cats and dogs. If they sure. don't have kids, they certainly have a pet. Let me tell you. Yes, but if they have a pet, what's the difference in vacuuming versus mopping? What vacuuming if is probably really easier. Like to, what if they What if they like to have a lot of guys' nights or girls' nights where you're having red wine and beer and you know you got a lot of stupid friends. Hmm? Well, stupid friends is not something that I often take into consideration. I hey, you I, remember that I had this I one spilled, friend who uh, spilled the glass all over your couch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you weren't you in the stupid friend category and, until then. Right. Well, then I became a stupid friend. So some people have stupid friends. Yeah. Um, so, but it's also you know dust. Like it's easy to swiffer. Under a okay, lot so of let's okay, so furniture. let's let's say for a minute somebody has a legitimate concern about it. Like I'm, you know, there's a difference between bypassing a house because it has it and recognizing the opportunity to change it. A lot of people will say, um, "Oh no, I, you know, they don't want to take on that task." So let's okay. give an example. That task is something that could probably be done in a couple of days, one day, maybe before you even move in, right? And you can even... And it's not that expensive. No. No. But here's... Okay. Here's a better example. When we talk about stop being picky, this is not your forever home. You know what I find a lot of first-time buyers want? What's that? Big kitchen. Right. Well, how are you going to put a big kitchen in a small home? (laughs) Forget about how the kitchen looks like we're not talking about cabinetry and countertops and flooring and appliances and all that right now. I'm just talking about the size of the kitchen. Look, you're not buying a home. That's whatever a million bucks that has a beautiful eight that Going back to your point, that HGTV open concept kitchen with waterfall countertops on the the island and you know built-in appliances like come on give me a break like you can cook out of a little shitty ugly kitchen for a few years to to make some money and and then you're using the equity in that place to be a little bit more picky in the next home and then right. from the next home you have more equity to be a little bit pickier well like very, what was your first few- job Versus where you where are you selling now? Right? Well, I don't mean I you specifically. My first job, right? Well, oh, there's a good I example. Thought, yeah, you I went you were from, asking me. I was sort of was, but it wasn't. I mean, it was understandable why you would answer me, uh, considering I asked it and we're talking to each other. 
Well, there's a good example. Technically, my first job was as an electrical apprentice when the union had a summer program for kids. I quickly realized that um, working in a blue collar industry was not for me. So I consider my first job selling shoes. Thanks so for there asking. you go. From selling shoes to selling houses. Look at the transition, right? You got to you got to work your way up. Um, right. But another thing I think is I think I think the um, I don't know who the world uh, has people people <laughs> people have kind of like glamorized the concept of owning your your primary residence. Um, where now you see more, especially on TikTok, and I mean, maybe it's because it interests me. That's what, just what I see in my feed. But um, you see more people out there educating people on the fact that a primary residence isn't necessarily the best purchase. There was an article not long ago I saw, actually it was a while ago, and then I saw something come up recently again about it, but somebody who owned something like eight houses in Toronto and lived at home with his parents. And, you know, so so when we talk about buying your first home, Uh, or buying your first house, you know, maybe it's not even your home, maybe it's your rental. And that's how you get your foot in the door, you're renting it out. It's a lot easier to sell a rental two years from now, to cash in on it and not turn your life upside down, because you don't have to move. Right. And then you've got some more flexibility there too. Well, then it becomes a lot. It becomes a different discussion. And your mortgage um, approval changes if it's not your your primary residence. Um, taxation well, purposes. I'm not going to go on record to say yeah, anything. Don't, but yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's an off record discussion. Or is that it's, what you say? Yeah, I guess this is considered the record, so I'll stop talking. Um, you know, I will correct what you said and talk about. You know, purchasing your first. You corrected yourself going from purchasing your first home to purchasing your first house. I'll even further correct you by saying purchasing your first property. Right. What would it, Um, if it wasn't a house, what would it be? Purchasing real estate. Right. Um, But anyways, you know. Or you find the balance. Hang on, or you find the the balance, right? Where you buy a house that is also an investment because you're renting the basement out. Yeah. Or you're renting, it's a duplex. Maybe you buy a duplex. See, so I don't know if you, you saw, uh, there is a release in Milton. Uh, whole new subdivision, whole new area. Never, new homes have not been constructed in this area for, um, I, I don't think there was ever a subdivision <laughs> created in this area. Up by um, New Tremaine Road and the future 401 interchange, which has happened there um there's a developer there's several developers that own land around that area um, it's a great spot that is, it's a great spot um so anyways the first builder and i won't mention names at this point if you want details you can contact me um they released floor plans last week actually uh so this podcast will um air past the, re- the initial release of these homes but it, i don't know if you looked at it no i haven't yet they're they're detached homes they're they're beautiful the floor plans are fantastic the really the offering is tremendous and the price is not too bad um but they don't have backyards mm-hmm. They have side little courtyards. So you're talking about now a 2,500 square foot home having less, I'll call it green space, less grass than a typical two-story townhome. Um, well, that's the way it's going. What they did was they pushed, they pushed the garages to the back, but at the back of the house, and then there's a side entrance with a fully, uh, ba- basically a self-contained um, basement with a separate laundry. So Smart. they are basically setting up this home as a two-family home to, to be able to rent out the basement. Um, 
So it'll be interesting to see because if you think about it, those homes, you know, you can buy a detached home in that development for, I think, starting from 1.4, 1.3. Let's say you splurge and you go to 1.5, mortgage on a $1.5 million house with 20% down, quick math, uh, uh, five grand a month. Um, Now you can rent out the basement for $1,500 a month. It's only costing you 3,500 bucks. So you save, you know, quite a bit. So you can or you live in the house. basement and rent out the upstairs for twenty five hundred bucks a month. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of things happening like that in the market. Anyways, it's not your forever home, so uh, be less picky. So there's there's three very very good uh, starting points. Uh, we're gonna leave the link in the description. So if you want to go and download the first time home buyer guide, if you go onto our website, Adrian wrote a nice blog about it recently. Um, so lots of information that we've made available for you for free. We're not, you know, hassling you for any of your info or whatever. Um, you can even text us, whatever, just tell us you want the guide. Uh, we'll send it over to you. Lots of great tips. Uh, episode 159 coming up next week is Good chatting with you a chat about first time home owners uh, tips on first time home owners and then 160 we're doing uh, first time investors so stay tuned for those uh, yes good chatting with you as well thanks for listening to episode 158 KT Confidential the real estate podcast uh, we'll talk to you next week signing off <laughs>